Okay. The opinions and views expressed by the participants during this broadcast do not reflect nor represent Service for Christ Ministries Incorporated, our faith partners, or any affiliated organization. Service for Christ Ministries Incorporated assumes no responsibility nor legal liability for the expressions or opinions made during this broadcast. This broadcast serves as an open forum for the right of the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Furthermore, this broadcast may not be used, altered, or edited without the authorization of Service for Christ Ministries Incorporated. Praise the Lord, saints, and welcome to the Gospel Truth. You take all the grief this world has to offer Take me. Once again, my brothers and sisters, we want to welcome you to another session with the Gospel Truth. <clears throat> I am Jerry Jones, uh, one of your hosts, along with our co-hosts, uh, Reverend, Reverend Harry E. Lundy. And we're just so privileged, we're so pleased to have you all uh, join us today on the Gospel Truth. We just ask God to uh, continue to, uh, to bless you and uh, to keep you in his care. And before we begin, we'd like to um, uh, start with our scripture reading on the gospel truth that is found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 1 through 4. For those of you that have your Bibles, please feel free to join in with us. Uh, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians read as follows. Uh, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have uh, believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. And my brothers and sisters, what we actually believe here at our service for Christ Baptist Church is that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Son of God, and that he died for my sins and your sins, according to the scripture. He came to serve as a sacrifice, indeed, the propitiation for us, because we were all dead in sin and Christ from, from glory past uh, decided that before the foundation of the earth, 
he was already slain. He had already mm -hmm. decided that he was going to come and die for you and I, mm -hmm. so that we could inherit the right to eternal life. Oh, what a mighty, mighty God that we in fact serve. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was willing to come and, and have his hands marred, nails put through them, have his flesh ripped wide open, have a crown of thorn placed on his head and given a purple robe so that he could go to Calvary's cross and pay the ultimate penalty of death for your sins and mine. I tell you the truth, it really is something to get excited about that he died for us. And then on the third day was resurrected. Amen. Into the newness of life, where he now sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, interceding for you and I. Wow, that's really mind blowing when you stop and think about how he can intercede for my sin. And someone over in China who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God intercede for their sin for someone that's in Russia or Hong Kong or in England, all at the same time. Wow, what a mighty God we serve. Amen. That is, in fact, the gospel truth, my brothers and sisters. And so we declare to you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that he died, he served as the perpetuation for your sin and mine. And we're excited to be able to propagate this gospel. Well, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love and your peace. We thank you for your patience. And even now, dear God, as we stand at the feet of the cross, begging for your grace and your mercy to come and be a part of our lives. We thank you, dear Jesus, for dying on that cross at Calvary thousands of years ago where your blood still prevails, your blood still has the power. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for interceding for us even right now. Now, dear God, we pray for a Reverend Harry E. Lundy, the co-host and our internet pastor at Servants for Christ Baptist Church. We pray, dear God, that Reverend Lundy will deliver a message of divine power to your people. That he will deliver that message that whosoever hears it, well, ask that simple question, what must I do to be saved? Thank you, dear God. Bless Reverend London as he brings forth the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank My brothers and sisters, I'd like to present to you our, our co-host our, our, our co and associate assistant to the pastor, rather, at Serving for Christ Baptist Church, of Reverend Harry E. Lundy, who is our internet pastor. His message today is, is going to bring us uh, a response to suffering. Responding to suffering is, in fact, the title. Many of you out there might be suffering right now. The scripture is coming from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, we're asking you now to go get your Bible and a cup of tea. Sit by the fireplace and get ready to receive a powerful message on 1 Peter, chapter 3, Verses 18 through 22. May God bless you as you hear the message from Reverend Harry E. Lundy. Reverend Lundy, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm blessed. I bless God you. is good. Do you, do you have any thoughts about, um, uh, before you get into your message, do you have any thoughts about the gospel truth, about uh, Jesus Christ down on the cross for us? Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, the, the thoughts I have about that is that uh, Jesus went through with that, showing, showing his love for us. And the, the point is, when are we going to show our love for him? Wow. By being obedient to his father. Amen. Show his way. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, are you going to talk to us today about um, uh, response, responding to suffering? Well, we look forward to hearing that message from you today, and we praise God for you. Please go right ahead and deliver your message that you're going to deliver to us today, sir. God bless you. Uh, thank you, Reverend Jones, and God bless you, and God and bless all those who have tuned in to us uh, this morning. Amen. Uh, the title of the message, as Dr. Jones has mentioned, has mentioned responding to suffering. If you'll turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, 
verses 18 through 22. And it reads like this. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it reads like this. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight, eight souls were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience, conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Amen. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, I come before your throne of grace to thank you for another day that you have made. Bless those who are watching. Give them understanding of your word and strength that they may follow your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. There's a part in this scripture that I just read that's sort of complicated. I wonder if, if I can see if I can explain that right now. It says there is also an anti-type which now saves us in uh, baptism. And, and what, what that is, is the flood was a lot of water that, that killed a lot of people. But at the same time, that flood of water saved Noah and his people. And at the same time, we'd be baptized in the water and we pulled up out of the water in symbolizing what Christ had to go through in his uh, uh, going into the ground and coming up into resurrection. It just doesn't mean that baptism saved you. Uh, it doesn't mean that baptism uh, cause you to be reborn or born again, which we need to be saved, which we need for salvation. But it's speaking of uh, when we get baptized, we do it uh, publicly to show that we have lined ourselves up with Christ, that we belong to Christ, that we are Christians. And that's what that verse is, is talking about, about the water, about the baptism, and that it's not for us to, to take a bath or be washed be washed clean, but it symbolized uh, also Jesus Christ's re resurrection when we come up out of the water from being baptized. And the fact that that water, that ocean that destroyed the whole world did save the Noah. And it, it, and it was pleasing to God where the part is talking about a uh, 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 con good conscience toward God. Amen. So we are exposed to a world system energized by Satan and his demons. Their effort is to discredit the church and to destroy its credibility and integrity. One way demons work is by finding Christians who lives are not consistent with the word of God and then parading them before the unbelievers to show what a sham the church is. During this pandemic, unb unbelievers do not mind shutting down churches 
We know a time is coming and the time is now when Christians will start to suffer. Not that many of us have not already been suffering. On a large scale around the world, Christians are going to suffer unjustly. Peter in this passage is saying that Christ suffered unjustly. The just for the unjust. The folk that are mistreating Christians are the folk that are energized by Satan. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 and 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this dark age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realm. When did this wrestling start and why? Genesis 3, 13 and 15 give us this account. Eve said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Today, people are still being deceived left and right. Deceit started back then. So the Lord God said to the serpent, the serpent, of course, is Satan, come in form as a snake, serpent. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall, sometimes some translations say it shall, but it does say it is at the end of it anyway, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the why we wrestle against principalities and not with flesh and blood, though some blood we will be spilled. The first blood spilled was Abel's. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. There are a lot of people who say the sons of God are the descendants of Seth, but they, they won't find no support for that in the scriptures. Let me show you how that cannot be the truth. See, Seth's offspring would come about through pre-procreation and would be called sons of men. Angels were created directly by God and thus sons of God. In Job chapter 1 and 6, and it reads, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. These, these were angels. It was talking about angels. A third of the angels are working with Satan. No doubt Satan have dispatched them among the people who God has made in the image of and in his like, likeness. Do you believe that godly men of Seth all of a sudden became ungodly 
and married a bunch of ungodly women of Cain. The term sons of God is used only six times in the, enti in the entire Old Testament. Twice in Genesis, and that's at six and two, and also Genesis six and four. Three times in Job, Job one, verse six, Job chapter two, verse one, Job chapter 38, verse seven, and once in the book of Daniels, guess what? In all those usages of the term sons of God, they all are talking about angels. In the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but be like the angels of God in heaven. Some people use that as a reason not to believe that these were angels. But those angels in the days of Noah were not in heaven. They did not keep their domain, but left their own abode. Of verse 18 and 19 of 1 Peter, this chapter 3, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited on the days of Noah. They had to wait 120 days on uh, uh, while Noah was preparing that ark. The wait was 120, excuse me, the wait was 120 years. And during that time, Noah was preaching to these people and, and God's word was going through one ear and out the other, it seems, because these were not normal people. Fallen angels are not going to listen to God's word. Genesis 6 and 4. There were giants, Nephilims, on the earth in those days, and also afterwards. And it says these people were on the earth during those days, and afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. So when did they... When were the giants or Nephilims with that term Nephilim also is translated as falling ones? So when did they come? When the, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These Nephilims came when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. The Nephilim translate as to the fall, fallen, fallen angels. It mentions that the Nephilims were on the earth after the days of Noah, and they were seen in Canaan, the land that God was given to the Israelites. And Israel received divine help in order to fight against them. Because when the, the initial spies went out, some of them saw these Nephilims and, and they felt like grasshoppers among them. And they were heroes, they were great fighters. And so Israel would have been at a disadvantage if they didn't receive help to fight these Nephilims. So it says, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn and in his hand. And as 
Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? So the man said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua had more than comparable help that the Israelites needed in going to combat with in obtaining the promised land. The spirits in prison that Jesus preached to were those angels put there by God for not keeping their proper domain, but left their own abode, Jude. One and six, Jesus had just died on the cross and those fallen angels could have thought Jesus was defeated and they were going to be released from the abyss. Jesus perhaps preached about his victory. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward will live ungodly and deliver and delivered righteous Lot, just like he delivered righteous Noah. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation, 2 Peter 2, 4 through 9. So Satan is on the attack. He was going after the seed and all he has experienced are defeats. John in Revelation said at chapter 12, verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast, where was he cast to? He was cast out of heaven. He was cast to earth and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12, 12 says this, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. He doesn't have much time. Satan's assaults on the seed all failed. The killing of Abel was the first assault. For God has appointed another seed to me, said Eve, instead of whom Cain killed, Genesis 4.25. Satan fell during the days of Noah 
and a lot of his angels were eternally incarcerated. Satan did not know just where or how that seed that is going to crush his head is going to show up. Was the seed to come through Shem? Was it through Nimrod or Abraham? Genesis 21, 12 says, God said to uh, Sarah said this, whatever Sarah say to you, God said this to Abraham, whatever Sarah say to you, listen to her, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. And from Isaac came Esau and Jacob. Where is the seed? It was in Jacob and showed up in Joseph as an example of the seed crushing, crushing seed. The head crushing seed, Christ. Joseph was Christ like and suffered even for others, like Christ. He suffered for not only for his family, but for the whole world, of course. Famine had struck the whole world during that time. Israel, after a while, became as captivity in Egypt. The new pharaoh who did not know Joseph issued a decree to murder male babies at birth to stop the Jews from multiplying so quickly. An effort influenced by Satan, no doubt. An effort influenced by Satan to stop the seed. Moses got through. Another one like Christ to see. The law was established and sin identified. We know that God was at work all the time. The seed was given to Judah and came through Tamar to her offspring Perez, through Rahab, Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, and David. And then there were Mary and Joseph of the line of David. The seed Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And even then a decree was put out by Herod to put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, Satan continued to seek the seed. You know how the story went. Jesus grew up and John the Baptist came preaching repentance and the kingdom of heaven being at hand, prepare the way. Jesus began his ministry after being baptized by John. And soon thereafter, here comes Satan. Jesus was led away by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Matthew 4 and 1. Satan may have thought he got a victory when Jesus committed his spirit to his father on the cross. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were open. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. We will face suffering, therefore, be prepared. If the world hates you, 
you know that it hated Christ before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but Christ chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you, John 15, 16 through 19. We are to arm ourselves with the same mind as Christ. This will be our best response to suffering. Let us be careful about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let our primary desire be the will of God. Let our desire be also to always pray. For Christ also suffered once for, for sins. The just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit. Paul said, you said that we, we have been made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which we once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace we have been saved isn't that good news and raised and they raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. Right now we are challenged with this pandemic and churches being shut down around the world. We have not forgotten or I have not forgotten how Christians suffered at the hands of ISIS as America watched let not our dependence be upon our government. Do, do not put our trust in man. To many are allowing themselves to be influenced by the prince of the air, who is Satan. Be not conformed to this world. I remember when I was growing up, the Christian worldview dominated. Today, a Christian worldview is frowned on. And I remember when Christians were, Christianity was respected. But you see today that respect has gone away. In our colleges and universities today, if you are a strong follower of Christ, you will not only be harassed by some students, but even harassed by some of the fa faculty and, and professors. Christian values are no longer accepted, not only in the US, but around the world. Expect this to grow and grow and grow. 
Expecting this to grow, prepare yourself. Prepare your response to be in the mind of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The purpose of Peter's letter was to teach us Christians how to live in victory. Jesus already proclaimed and declared victory to the disobedient angels who had been reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. We are to be victorious, victorious. We are to live victoriously in the midst of any hostility without losing hope, without becoming bitter, while trusting in our Lord, while looking for the second coming. Peter knew that this time for living, that, that his time for living was growing short. Peter wished to impress upon us by living an obedient, victorious life under duress. A Christian can actually evangelize this hostile world by living a life under duress. We ought to obey God rather than men. We should obey the government authority as spelled out in Romans 13 and 7 and in 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 through 17. But when government decrees are clearly contrary to God's word, God must be obeyed. Paul says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Remember, we just had elections. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and will bring judgment on themselves. Romans 13, 1 and 2. Hopefully the government doesn't make any decrees contrary to God's word. And therefore, Paul urges us strongly to make supplications, prayers, intercessions, and give thanks for all men, for presidents, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and, and reverence. Mm -hmm. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God and our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Let us put on the mind of Jesus Christ in response to suffering. Amen. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name we come realizing that because Jesus suffered and was hated, that we're going to suffer and be hated. But we realize, Father, also that the mind of Jesus it was with that he overcome the world and has said to us that we may overcome the world. 
And with that in mind, with a mind like Jesus, thinking like Jesus, we may also overcome the world. But people must realize and help them realize that they need to know your word. They need to know your scripture, Father. Help them to realize that if there's any book they should read, it should be your word. Help people to realize this, Lord. We thank you for forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you will be with us when times get hard and guide us and lead us the way that we should go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. And thank you, Lord, for your word, amen. Well, Reverend Lundy, uh, may God bless you. Thank you. We have we have a lot of comments out here on um, on our Zoom on our Zoom and Facebook page. I'm, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna read some of these comments and questions that people have. Uh, first of all, let me commend you once again on a very profound, uh, positive collection of ideas and thoughts uh, concerning suffering. I think that you went from Genesis. Uh, to revelation in your exposition, your message today. And uh, from Servants for Christ Baptist Church, we are so privileged and proud of what you have done here today. And uh, as a result of that, I, I have a few comments, if you don't mind, and uh, uh, a few questions from our um, Facebook audience as well. Uh, your message focused in on suffering and how to respond to suffering. You know, you talked a little bit earlier in the message today uh about uh, uh genesis chapter six uh, verses five and six uh dealing with the flood and how god uh himself in genesis five and six uh, was grieved at his heart that he had even made man in the first place because of the nephilim that you spoke of and the fact that god said that my spirit shall not always uh strive with man when the intermingling, the unnatural relationship between the, the Nephilim, who you describe as the fallen angels mentioned in Jude 6, Jude 6 as well, uh, those angels that did not keep their first estate and how mankind suffered as a result of that, uh, those fallen angels, the fallen ones that you describe, um, and this advanced theology that you talk about, you talk about people living ungodly and one of the things that we want to know is uh, during their time of suffering, people suffer. Do they suffer? You talked about Job somewhat. Do people suffer uh, because of unrighteousness? I mean, is all suffering as a result of unrighteousness? There are people who say that the Bible declares that Job suffered. And the Bible said that he was a man that uh, issue of evil. And... Uh, had had no real penalty that God was willing to wipe him out. So all suffering is not a result of um, of sinning, but it is a result, I believe, of God's wrath in some cases and his divine will and providence in other cases. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what can people do when they're living righteous and they suffer anyway? You have to continue to live righteous, even though they suffer anyway. All suffering is not punishment for something you've done wrong. Some suffering is, is accomplished even if you do something right, because you're gonna have enemies coming up against you. If you are a follower of Christ, Christ suffered and Christ did nothing wrong. And like you mentioned Job, Job had done nothing wrong, but he suffered you will suffer trying to follow Christ to do what's right because Satan is here. That's why I brought up that we wrestle not with flesh and blood and that now I try to indicate where that, that wrestling began. So I had showed where what God had said to Satan about his a seed crushing his head and, and his, his seed uh, uh, bruising the heel. And I, and I follow that from that point on, and Satan is still hard at work trying to 
win a victory from him realizing what's going to happen to him and his well, uh, uh, let me ask, uh, uh, let's go back. I got about four or five other questions coming off of the Facebook page. But let's go back to Genesis chapter six, where, uh, where, uh, where God, it grieved God to his heart. Uh, God does grieve, according to what the scriptures say, grieve to his heart that he had made man in the first place because man's thoughts uh, were continually evil. I just want to point that out in Genesis chapter uh, six. Uh, you mentioned that the world hate us. Why, why does the world hate us again? Uh, the world hate us probably under the influence of Satan. You're hating us under the influence of Satan. And, and God, uh, when, it, when he found out how, how man was becoming evil, remember man was living to be 900 and some years old, but God cut that down to 120 years. And now look how, how long we, we, we live. And also an indication that uh, 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 God has limits to his kindness. The man became so evil instead of man being able to live 900 years, he cut it to 120 years, and and it, it, he has even cut it short. Yeah, many uh, many actually believe that uh, man's body was designed to live forever until he's sinned in the Garden of Eden. You know, and you're right, God does have boundaries, as as we told that in the book in the creation account, God told the waves to come this further and go no further, and and and, and that's also found in the book of Job. We have a couple of questions here from um, the persons on the Facebook page. One question is, and we can you know, say it however brief you like, uh, how do we live victorious when we are suffering? Uh, we live victorious even though we suffer and we, we overcome the, the, the suffering. We don't okay. let the suffering stop us from doing what we're supposed to do. Okay, you talk a little bit about uh, doing what the government says within the, the auspices of our faith. Uh, what do you do when some in the government advocate racism, bias, and prejudice against certain classes of people? Uh, we, don't, we, do, we don't practice what, if, if government brings that forth, we won't practice that. We won't be practicing the racism and things because that that's going against God's will. Okay, Another, and God doesn't even mention any race, and he he mentioned ethnic group, but God doesn't mention race in in the Bible. Okay, uh, Reverend Beverly Moses uh, say, "Praise God!" I think the professing believers misuse and perverted the representation of the church. Uh, 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 misrepresentation of the church. Uh, let me see if I can get this right. Being largely responsible for the loss of respect toward Christianity, our faith became too much identified with the impotent uh, against the power and works of Satan in matters of justice, equity. Unfortunately, the name of Christ was and continues to be used by some to justify racism and white supremacy. But uh, let God be true and every man a lie. The day is indeed coming when he shall judge the world, starting with those who profess to be the church. What do you think about that statement? That's a very accurate statement that she made there. Okay. And we can recall the seven churches uh, in Revelation. Of the seven churches, only two were following Christ. The rest were messed up. Yeah, that's true. She's right. I agree with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have another comment from uh, Reverend Dr. Beverly Moses. Uh, she says, amen. You have got to know God's word for yourself. And the only way to do that is to read the word yourself. And by the way, Reverend Dr. Beverly Moses has her own platform where she's walking through the Bible. You can get in contact with her through uh, Reverend uh, Beverly A. Moses on your Facebook page. She walks through the Bible every day. 
What do you say about that? Uh, 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 Reverend uh, Lundy, she said the only way you can get to know God's word is that you have to read the word for yourself. Not, not only do I agree with that, even Paul mentioned that. Paul was pleased with the Bereans as they were checking him out when he was bringing forth the word. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, she's right on with that. Okay, she has a final comment, Reverend Dr. Beverly Moses. Uh, said excellent teaching, uh, Reverend Lundy, and we have another uh, uh, we have another um, comment, and I, I, that comment is coming from me. Um, you talk about living ungodly. Uh, how can people live godly? Um, it's it's very difficult to do especially when you have become accustomed to how the world is. You come, become accustomed to looking at television, you become accustomed to looking at, listening to various types of music, all that's influencing on you. It's gonna be hard to pull away with that. And some, sometimes you wanna turn off that television and, and get into God's word. And that's how you can be, begin uh, coming to live godly by knowing God's word and turning off that that outside noise coming from the world is what we will have to force ourselves to do. Okay. Uh, you're, I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. Were you gonna say something else? No, no. Okay, so your sermon title today, your message came across very loud and clear to our, our church and our, our Facebook uh, audience worldwide. Uh, Responding to suffering. I think that you've given us a great impetus to move forward. Uh, when we come back from our outro, we'd like for you to, to uh, give us your final and concluding thoughts and what our charge is as a result of hearing this message today. Uh, just exactly what is it that you want us to do as new Christians? Should we join the church? Should we go to a Bible-believing church? Should we come to Sermon for Christ Baptist Church, or should we read the Bible? I mean, uh, I mean, how are we going to respond to this suffering? You know, suffering is everywhere that we turn. People are suffering financially; they're suffering morally; they're suffering. If you listen to our sermon today uh, at Sermon for Christ Baptist Church at eight thirty this morning, we our sermon title was simply uh, uh, about God, and we were essentially talking to our congregation uh, today, almost about suffering, but our, but our focus uh, uh, really was on being a witness, being a witness for God. And I believe that if we do some of that witnessing that we will in fact uh, be in a better relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We'll be right back with more of the gospel truth after this outro message. Uh, concerning our church. Hi, this is First Lady Minister Patricia Ann Jones. Thank you for watching our broadcast, The Gospel Truth. Please visit our website. You can visit our Facebook page on Servants for Christ Baptist Church or our YouTube page, Search Servants for Christ Baptist Church. To support our ministry, visit Servants for Christ Inc. Dot org. Our church phone number is 240-244-2564. For prayer requests, call 240-241-0849. Or you can always email us on slcbcministry at gmail.com. Thank you for viewing our broadcast. And our scripture for this year, 2020, is Hebrews 11, 1, walking in faith. So again, thank you for watching our show. And always come and visit us at Servants for Christ Baptist Church, where our pastor is the Reverend Dr. Jerry W. Jones, Jr. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Salvation comes to those who ask. But many will not take the path. They will live on. Well, my brothers and sisters, we're back. And before we turn it over to Reverend Lundy, 
I just want to say that uh, Reverend Dr. Beverly Moses has given us her website for walking through the Bible for many of you who, who in fact, would like to uh, learn more about the Word of God on a step-by-step -step basis. Uh, that's Reverend Dr. Beverly Moses, www.walkingthroughtheword.org. Each, each day, each, each day she's on and she's walking you through the word with, with, with force and power. As Reverend Dr. Moses, Beverly Moses, www.walkingthroughtheword.org. May God continue to bless you as you study with her and walking through the word. And she will be able to answer many questions that many of you have. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Beverly Moses. Uh, Reverend, Reverend Lundy, uh, would you mind closing us out with your final thoughts and your final words to us this evening? And may God continue to bless you, sir. Thank you. Uh, with regard to suffering, we, we, we've been uh, tasked with going forward, uh, being witnesses to, to Christ. And then sometimes being a witness to Christ, you're going to meet with hostility. And that will cause some suffering, too. But we, we need to take heed to the encouragement given to us by Peter and give ourselves entirely over to God. We will be in a better condition to endure suffering and persecution if we are strongly into God and knowing his word that is being presented even by Beverly, uh, Minister Beverly Mo Moses. We are to remain faithful in this time of distress, even uh, under this pandemic, I noticed I've, I've read where a lot of uh, Japanese people are committing suicide because of, of what this pandemic has done to them. And, and we know that God work all things together for good to them who, who love him and to them who are called according to, to his purpose. But I know people are, are, are lacking in patience, but he waits upon the Lord will renew their strength. They should mount up with wings like eagles. They should run and not be weary, walk and not faint. We do serve a good God. Just hang in there. He may not come when we want him to, but God is always on time. So with that, let's uh, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forevermore. Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good day, everyone. Amen. This is the Gospel Truth. Pastor Jerry Jones, along with um, Reverend Harry Lundy, we will see you next time on the Gospel Truth, next Sunday at 11 o'clock, where you will hear another powerful message from Reverend Harry E. Lundy and yours truly. May God bless you. This is the Gospel Truth. Bye now.